Today we're going to talk about uniform circular motion. Now this word uniform, what that means is that this object is moving in a circle at a constant speed. Now the reason that I say constant speed and I have speed in italics here is because the velocity itself is not constant. The reason for this is because remember velocity is a vector and a vector has both a magnitude and a direction. So what this means is that because the velocity vector is constantly changing direction, it's not a constant velocity. Now, how does velocity change? Well, remember the definition of acceleration is a change in velocity. So in this case, the acceleration is changing the direction of velocity, but not the actual magnitude of velocity because this object is moving in a circle at a constant speed. So the velocity vector is constantly changing direction from an acceleration. We call this acceleration the centripetal acceleration. Now what centripetal means is it means center seeking. Um, the equation that we get to find the actual magnitude of the acceleration is velocity squared, and we can just use speed here, so really it's just magnitude of velocity squared over radius, which is what your r is down there. Now I'm going to talk about the the actual direction of acceleration in a bit. So don't worry about that right the second. This is how we find the magnitude of centripetal acceleration. Now we know the centripetal force, if we use Newton's second law, which is just met force equals mass times acceleration, what we're gonna do is just plug in centripetal acceleration into that equation and we get centripetal force is equal to mass times velocity squared over radius. Now for this centripetal force, there's a lot of different forces that can be, that can cause circular motion and therefore be a centripetal force. I'll talk about that in a little bit and we'll do a bunch of examples today so that you can, um, that, that can be really clear. Now to find the magnitude of the velocity, we're going to actually go back to like the very beginning of this class and this just the definition of a constant velocity was distance over time. Now here, this object is moving in a circle, so the distance is actually going to be the circumference of the circle, and then the time that it takes for that object to travel one circumference will be the time for one revolution. There's actually a special name for that, which is the period, and it's denoted by a capital T. So circumference of a circle is 2 pi r over capital T, which is our period. Capital T is a period of time for one revolution, and the units of T or, or period are seconds per revolution. So if it takes this object uh, 15 seconds to go around the circle one time, our period there would be 15 seconds. So it's just the number of seconds per revolution there. Now let's talk about the direction of these things. Now, usually we do a lab in class, um, but of course we're not in class right now, so I did it for you. Um, Rowdy helped, you can see his little paw <laughs> holding down the plate for me. Um, so let's watch this video here and then I'm gonna talk about the direction of force, acceleration, and velocity in circular motion. Oh, no, play, here we go. So we can see this golf ball is going around the circle. Now, if I, I drew the golf ball here on this little um, figure down here, it's at the top right hand corner, and we can see that the sides of those plates are going to be the that what the force is that's keeping that golf ball in circular motion. If the plate didn't have that lip right there, it wouldn't that golf ball wouldn't go around in circular motion. So when the golf ball is right here at the top right hand corner, we can see that the side of the plate is making is right there that's causing this golf ball to go around in a circle right there so if we're talking about the force that's actually causing this circular motion would this be like the force of tension the force of friction it's the force of the side of the plate right so what do we call that we call this the normal force, all right? So the normal force is actually the centripetal force that's causing this circular motion. Now we know that normal force is always perpendicular to whatever surface we're talking about. In this case, it's the surface of the side of that plate or the lip of the plate. So that normal force is going to be perpendicular to that surface. And as the ball moves around, 
that normal force is going to be changing direction. But we can see that the centripetal force, which is the normal force in this case, is always going to be directed toward the center of the circle. We can also see that, well, we also know that the acceleration, in this case centripetal acceleration, is in the direction of the net force. So that means centripetal acceleration is also directed toward the center of the circle. So that's the first important thing that I want you guys to write down and remember is that the centripetal force and therefore the centripetal acceleration are both pointed toward the center of the circle there. Now, let's talk about velocity. So here you can see that I have cut a little fourth, the fourth, one fourth of that plate is cut out right there and I'm going to push this golf ball. Now what I want you to think about is what happens when it gets here. Does it go straight? Does it still follow the curve of the plate? Does it curve to the right? Or would do you think it would just go straight off to a 90 degree angle to the right? What do you think? Make a prediction now. All right. I'm not sure I understand. Siri, shush. Now, if I play this, we're going to see what happens. All right, so let's a. play it. We can see that it pretty much goes straight. I know that it kind of curves in between these right here, but it's just because the lip of the um, plate kind of makes a weird thing. Um, so the answer here is B, all right? Now, the reason this is the answer is because that golf ball has inertia. We know from Newton's first law that an object in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. The unbalanced force here is the lip of the plate that is causing that ball to go into circular motion. As soon as the lip of the plate is gone, it's just gonna keep going for in the same direction that it was going before. It doesn't have that centripetal force anymore to make it go in circular motion. So we call this tangential velocity. The velocity vector is pointed tangent to the path, which is perpendicular to both the centripetal force and the centripetal acceleration. All right. Sorry for that rude interruption by my computer and by Siri. I hope it won't happen again. I'm trying to get through this so I can post it for you guys. <laughs> All right, let's talk about centripetal force. Now, I talked about how this is a general force because there are a lot of different forces that can act to cause circular motion. Some examples of this would be that golf ball going around the plate that we were just talking about. That's just the normal force from the sides of the plate that's causing the circular motion. We also can have something on a string that's being swung in a circle, that would be tension. And we'll talk, we'll give an example of that in a second. Also, if we have this figure down here, we can see that there's a car going around in circular motion. The force that's actually causing that motion would be friction because if you picture this car on ice or something like that, it would just slide right off the road. So friction has to be present in order to keep that car going in a circle. Another example in this figure right here, we have the moon going around the earth. That would be the force of gravity making that moon orbit the earth. And then something like a Ferris wheel, we can actually have a combination of forces acting to cause circular motion. In this case, it would be like the force of gravity in the normal force. And I have another example of that in a bit. So let's do an example. We have a string of 80 centimeters long breaks when its tension is 150 newtons. What is the greatest speed at which it can be used to whirl a 1.2 kilogram stone in a horizontal circle? So First, let's write down our givens. We have that the string is 80 centimeters long. Now, can we use centimeters in physics? I hope you said no. Remember, we have to convert that to meters. Also, when they're giving us the length of the string, they're really just giving us the radius. We can see that if this string right here is our radius of the circle because she's holding it in the center right there. So they're giving us radius. So givens, we have the length, which is the radius, is 80 centimeters, which is equal to 0.8 meters. And it says that it breaks when its tension is 150 newtons. Basically, because we're looking for the greatest speed, we want to just set tension equal to 150 newtons. Because anything past that, that string is going to break. So we're looking for the maximum. So we get force of tension is 150 newtons. The mass of the stone is 1.2 kilograms. And we are looking for the, the maximum velocity that we can whirl that stone around. So 
Um, next thing I want to do is I want to write down Newton's second law. I know net force is equal to mass times acceleration. And then also, we what is the force that's causing that centripetal motion? What am I going to plug in for force right there? Well, if I draw a little free body diagram on that stone, I can see that I have my force of tension right here going toward the center of the circle. Okay, so that right here, my centripetal force is going to be my force of tension. So I am going to insert that into my equation, and also I'm going to add centripetal uh, acceleration into the equation, which is velocity squared over r. So I get force of tension is equal to mass times velocity squared over r. Now we can just plug in our numbers. I know force of tension is 150 newtons, mass is 1.2 kilograms, and radius is 0.8 meters. So now I'm going to multiply both sides by 0.8 to get rid of that 0.8 on the denominator on the right hand side. I get 120 equals 1.2 kilograms times velocity squared. Now I'm going to divide both sides by 1.2 in order to get v squared by itself. We get 100 is equal to v squared, and then just take the square root of both sides, and we get velocity is 10 meters per second. So anything past that, or at 10, that string is going to break.